here we are on the eve of a new year. <clears throat> Happy New Year's! <laughs> yes! <laughs> it's New Year's Eve and here you thought that it was just a Sunday after Thanksgiving in November. Surprise! Today is the final Sunday of the church year. This New Year's Eve might not have a countdown or confetti, although I did think about it and then thought about how hard that would make Norman's life. But we are standing at a threshold. The end and the beginning of the liturgical cycle. The liturgical year, or the church year, ends today on what is known as Christ the King Sunday, or Reign of Christ Sunday. It then begins anew next Sunday with Advent, my favorite of the liturgical cycle, the holy waiting for the birth of a newborn king. I like to think of liturgical time as an invitation. Liturgical time invites us into a different rhythm. It allows us, even just for one morning, to orient around spiritual seasons rather than the academic and fiscal quarters that tend to govern our daily lives. This threshold in the liturgical calendar offers an opportunity similar to that other New Year's Eve. It's a chance to review the past year and to set intentions for the one ahead. And I suggest that this morning we use the text from Matthew to do so. To use it as a bit of a spiritual check-in. Something that's easier said than done. For in the words of Pastor John Buchanan, Matthew 25 makes me very uncomfortable when I think about it too much. How many of us can relate? After all, Jesus doesn't exactly mince words here. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these siblings of mine, you did for me. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. How many of us, if we really sit with these words from Jesus, start to squirm just a little bit. We start to squirm because, if we're honest, we know that we passed someone in need and that we didn't visit the prison or that we failed to welcome the stranger. I want us to lean into that discomfort this morning. Faith is a balm for our souls, yes, but it's also a challenge, and that's a good thing. Self-examination, spiritual check-ins can be uncomfortable, but they are crucial for our growth and our well-being. Today's scripture from Matthew is part of this longer series of lessons that Jesus gives directly to his disciples. These include the lesson of the fig tree. Truly, I tell you, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The story of the faithful servant. 
Blessed is the one whom his master will find at work when he arrives. And the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. All of these teachings are preparing the disciples for how to live after Jesus is gone. And these lessons also predict actions that could be detrimental to the faith community. In Matthew 24, Jesus warns the disciples that antagonism, apathy, and love gone cold will push people away from the gospel. What a phrase, love gone cold. When I hear that, I think of all the research and the studies of the past several years that I've read on the general decline in those identifying as Christian or those attending church. And if you really listen to what people say about it, I think we might hear some resonances. People say that they leave the church because they aren't welcomed or because they see a hypocrisy between what Christians preach and what Christians do because they don't experience something that is meaningful or relevant to their lived reality. Sounds a lot like apathy within the church or perhaps love gone cold to me. Jesus was smart. He knew what would harm his gospel and he told his disciples about it. And so Jesus concludes all of these lessons with today's scripture, which interestingly is the only description of a final judgment in the New Testament. This is the only one. So we should probably pay attention to exactly what it is that Jesus is saying here. And a lot of the writing and discussion and sermons on this text focus on two things. One, who Jesus is talking to, and two, who Jesus is talking about. Does all nations, looking here at verse 32, refer only to the Gentiles? Which means that Jesus is not talking to those already within Judaism or what would become Christianity. Or does all nations really mean everyone? And who exactly are the least of these? Is that anyone who is hurting? Or, as some argue, is it a reference only to Christian missionaries, those who spread the gospel? This sort of biblical study, looking at the original language, putting it in context, it's critically important. I am so grateful for the scholars who devote their lives to this work. It's what helps me be able to preach a good sermon. And at the same time, as I was reading this week some of this specific textual debate, who is Jesus talking to, who is Jesus talking about, it felt a little avoidant. It it felt a little bit like sometimes the guiding question was, but does this really apply to me? Because if all nations only applies to the group that was known as the Gentiles, then those who identify as Christians are off the hook. Or if the least of these only applies to Christian missionaries, then maybe we don't have to be as concerned about the general poor. But if it does apply to us, well then, we might have to confront ourselves and our choices. I bet y'all already know where I'm gonna go with this, right? Let's assume Jesus is in fact talking to us. 
Let's assume that he's talking to you. Yes, you. And to me. Yes, me. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? After all, this is what Jesus consistently taught throughout his ministry. This is what Jesus taught and what Jesus did and who Jesus was, the embodiment of love for all people and especially for the least of these, for the refugee, the incarcerated, the unhoused, the poor, the sick, the ones who society despised and ignored. We can look throughout the Gospel of Matthew, for examples. In Matthew 22, 34 through 40, Jesus says that the greatest and first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and that the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Jesus says that love is for everyone, including the people that we consider to be our enemies. So I think it's fair to say that Jesus is talking to us in today's lesson on love in action. In using this text as a spiritual check-in, I want us to focus less on a binary, wherein you are either a sheep or a goat, and more on specific actions. When have you been a sheep? And when have you been a goat? Because the reality is, we're both. We all act in ways that align with our values and in ways that do not. Furthermore, we're both in the sense that we can find ourselves in the role of the one offering assistance and in the role of one needing it. I think that's so important. So often we listen to this scripture and we immediately identify with, with the one who offers assistance, but we also and if you haven't yet, at some point in your life, you will be the person in need of help. That's the reality of what it is to be human, to be both giver and receiver, to be both sheep and goat. Author Ibram X. Kendi encourages his readers to think about the terms racist and anti-racist, not as set identities, but as descriptive terms. He says they're like name tags that can be stuck on and peeled off. All of us, he writes, have the capacity to act, think, and behave in ways that are racist and in ways that are anti-racist. I want to suggest something similar for this metaphor of sheep and goats. Let's approach them as descriptive terms rather than identities that, that once we have, we have forever and ever. Think back over the last liturgical year. Think back from today to last Thanksgiving. When were you a sheep? <laughs> Bye. What actions did you take to feed someone, to welcome someone, to visit with someone who was sick or with someone who was incarcerated? When did you look at someone and see the face of God? Can you bring at least one moment to mind? Rejoice! in that moment, in those moments, because in them you, all of you, participated in the holy work of Jesus. That is amazing. Okay, now for the harder part. When were you a goat? When did you ignore the hungry or fail 
to welcome someone new in the area? When didn't you provide someone with clothing or other essentials when you could have? When did you see someone as a problem rather than as a sibling in Christ? Can you bring a moment to mind for that? Now, I want to suggest something that might sound strange. I want to suggest that you rejoice in those moments, too. Not for the choice you made. I think it's appropriate for us to feel uncomfortable and bad for our goat-like moments. I do. But rejoice because now, right now, you have the chance to see it clearly. Rejoice because you can ask for forgiveness from maybe the person you harmed or from God. Rejoice because you have, we all have the opportunity to make a different choice to change our minds, to grow. And that's incredible too. This text tells us that we are judged by our actions. That's true. We learn this from a young age. Our actions have consequences, right? For others, for the world, for us. It matters when we are a sheep and when we are a goat. But we also have to hold this right alongside the gift of salvation, the gift of grace. We're not None of us, defined by our worst, most selfish, most thoughtless, most goat-like moments. And that grace, it gives us the courage required for spiritual self-examination. That's not easy to do. It gives us the courage to say that we are sorry. It gives us the courage to repent, the courage to recommit ourselves for the coming year. And so on this New Year's Eve, what do you commit to do differently this year? How will you be not love gone cold, not apathetic, not antagonistic? How will you be love in action? And there are manifold opportunities. Look at the world around us. There are manifold opportunities. And none of us can do it all. None of us can do it all. But all of us can do something. So what are you going to commit yourself to? Are you going to maybe commit time or 30 extra minutes a week to a volunteer project? Or maybe reconsider your monthly spending. Maybe you sit next to someone new at church, or you join a ministry, or you join a protest, or you get involved with community building, or you take a meal to someone who can't be in person here with us. Or maybe you pray every day for the people with whom you interact. That's the invitation of Christ the King Sunday. The reign of Christ, that means Christ's kingdom, Christ's community. And it is defined by love. Love in action. So let's be part of it. Amen.